I'm excited. I'd like to take a moment to announce a new Bible study that I will be leading starting March 20th through June 5th. It's an eight-week study. We will be skipping Mother's Day and Easter Sunday to be with our families, of course. This also gives us two weeks until to watch the movie and give time for reflection, achievements, and opportunities. It's a small group study for men by Alex and Stephen Kendrick. It was inspired by the Resolution Challenge featured in the movie Courageous. The resolution contained 12 commitments related to the characteristics that all men of God want to pursue, such as responsibility, faithfulness, honor, justice, forgiveness, integrity, and courage. The Resolution Bible Study walks us through each of the 12 challenges, identifying their biblical roots and outlining how to live out each godly principle in real life. We all have our uh, challenges in life, but I think one of the most important challenges and responsibilities is to be the father and spiritual leader of our households that God wants us to be. There are many studies out there that prove why it is vital to our family, for, to your family, for you not only to understand, for, but for you to live out fatherhood biblically. One study in the words of Dr. Pruitt, positive father care is associated with more pro-social and positive moral behavior in boys and girls. This is borne out by research from the University of Pennsylvania, which indicates that children who feel closeness and warmth with their father are twice as likely to enter college, 75% less likely to have a child in their teen years, and 80% less, like, less likely to be incarcerated, and half as likely to show various signs of depression. Please, if you're a father, join me in committing to our God-given responsibilities in fatherhood and as the leader of your household. It won't be easy, I assure you, but we will learn and hold each other accountable to God's word for us so we can better be better fathers, husbands, and leaders. We have, I'm going to pass out a clipboard for anyone who wishes to sign up so I can get enough study books, and I'd greatly appreciate it and love to see all. Thank you. All right, let's pray for uh, this service today. Dear God, uh, we pray uh, for today, and we pray for this service right now. We pray that you would join us here uh, in this moment, that you would work in our hearts, and that you would help us uh, to become more like you. Help us to focus on what we need to focus on. Help us to learn what we need to learn. And just teach us, um, teach us what we need to do to grow in you. God, would you help build character in each one of us, that we would be individuals uh, that live out integrity, responsibility, kindness, and goodness in our world. God, would you be part of this service today? In your name I pray, amen. And now we have a ministry video about one of our uh, ministers, uh, missionaries abroad. We serve in a suburb uh, of Perth, Australia, that's roughly between seven and 10,000 people, so roughly population-wise, the same size as my hometown. We've been there for 10 years, and we continue to be the only church within the entire community. The people in Australia, they don't have any idea of the reality of how much is missing in their life without God. And um, when they see us live out our life, and they see that we're not afraid or we're not scared or um, we, we have strength when they don't. They wonder where that comes from and we share with them that that's God. Our ministry, if you boil it right now, is really making connection so that we can connect people with God. And a lot of times that's just through living life in our community and, and doing what we can to love people. The people that we reach through our kids programs, our youth programs, they don't have an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa, or anybody who's ever met Christ. They are the first person in their family, and they are leading others in their families. Our label is church planters, but we see more ourselves as culture planters, helping people turn on a spiritual switch in their lives. We're constantly busy connecting any way we possibly can. Two years ago, we started an upward sports camp and we saw 150 kids this year come to our soccer and cheerleading camp. And on a Friday, we had 43 kids stand and give their hearts to the Lord. 
And when we get to go back, we're going to get to see this next generation who is now risen up. And they're now reaching out to more. My greatest joy is seeing when someone gets the concept of grace and they're willing to submit themselves to that. We had a lady and she came knocking on my door at like 8 o'clock in the morning. She came running in with her Bible and she opened it and she said, I've been reading all the red words because that's what Jesus said. So I don't care what else is in there, I'm reading all the red words. <laughs> and she threw down her Bible onto the table and she said, I just don't get how Jesus can love everybody. She never experienced God's grace. And that moment for her was a huge moment of change in her life, of understanding that God has called us to so much more. Our supporters from America, uh, the churches and the individuals that pray for us, they are a huge part of our ministry. There aren't words to express the thanks and the gratitude that, that we have for them. You are the battery that keeps us going. Um, you are the source of energy. You are the source of life to our ministry and your letters, your support, your funds, your prayers, that's what keeps us on the field. And there's no place we want to be other than where God wants us to be. And we're just so glad that you're part of the team. Amen. Thankful for the ministry of the Georges there in Australia. And then, um, as, uh, as you know, we're featuring various missionaries throughout the month of February, so that's why we have that video. And also there's another uh, reading here. Uh, last week we saw a video of Don and Cheryl Floyd, global partner missionaries to Papua New Guinea, and we have this update from them. Exciting news, Sherry has been selected as the regional director over five mission nations. Papua New Guinea, Australia, Japan, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Uh, sounds like a very awesome responsibility. And they share this testimony of God's goodness a few days ago at the beginning of February. We are into the seventh day of a power outage. I went to the farm store to get a new generator. We need a fairly quiet one, but not too expensive, big enough to meet our power needs. They had several on display. Some too big, some too small, some too expensive. Checking their catalog, they found one that was just right. When they checked their store inventory, there were none in stock. But a further checking found an unopened shipment. I waited to see if there might be, if this might be the one. I needed uh, their, the right one I needed, excuse me. There were two in the shipment. <clears throat> the man behind me said he would buy them both if I didn't want one. Of course, I bought one. God provided right time, right place in line, right attitude of patience, wonderful provision. Praise to God for his provision. Don and Sherry Floyd. So it's very good to be hearing from these missionaries and learning a little more about what they're doing. Right at this time, our children will go downstairs, be dismissed for Sunday school. Come on. <laughs> All right, let's take a few moments to uh, spend time in prayer. I also had uh, an announcement, as Alan said, find the bulletin, what I do with it. Uh, but look in your bulletin, it's there in the center part of it, where the usual announcement about us, our study on Wednesday nights, has been about the names of God. But I've been thinking for a while that I would like to do something special uh, for Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of uh, the Lenten season. And the Lenten season, like Advent season, is a very special season, or should be, could be, for the church and the church calendar, the church year, uh, because it's a time of preparation, preparing us to think about the death of our Lord and then his resurrection. Um, Advent prepares us for Christmas. Lenten season helps to prepare our hearts for the celebration of uh, Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. 
So this Wednesday, what I'd like to do is have us all gather here, as many as would come, and regardless of the number, we will be here in the sanctuary for our service, for this special service, and we'll be serving communion. And in addition to that, um, I have ordered um, Lenten devotionals, um, and they're very, as I'm looking at them, they're very brief. It takes about 30 seconds to read them, but they're pithy. In other words, they have some good thought to them to make you think about the Lord's Supper, which is a very important part of us thinking about the Lord's death. And so I will be giving one of those away to everybody that comes on Wednesday night. Uh, it's a little bit of uh, bribery and manipulation here to help and encourage you to be here this Wednesday um, to get your free devotional, uh, Lenten devotional. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> At this time, we want to take prayer requests. We do want to remember the Zindel family in prayer at the passing of Johnny on Thursday night. He was taken off the ventilator on Thursday and somewhat rallied. And fortunately, his mother, Laura, and his aunt, Beverly, had time to spend with him and actually interact and talk to him uh, before he passed away that evening. But let's be in prayer for them. And then we want to, of course, continue to be in prayer for Sharon Hager, who was taken back to the hospital on Saturday. She has an infection, which they're trying to treat. Um, and, uh, and she has a high fever. Um, are there any other prayer requests? unspoken? Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's bow down for a bit of prayer. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time and opportunity for us to be together in the house of God. Father, we praise you for who you are. We honor you for being the creator of the universe the creator of all things, who continually teaches us your ways and shares with us through various means how to walk with you through Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning we bring to you uh, these needs that we have mentioned. Lord, we do pray for your comfort and peace to be with the Zindo family. Lord, be especially close to Johnny's mother, Laura, we ask that you would feel your loving care and presence with her here in the days ahead. Lord, we pray for Sharon Hager as she is in the hospital once again. And ask, Lord, for a miraculous touch from you to raise her up from that bed of illness. Lord, we pray that uh, this fever will be brought under control, that the infection will be, that you will take it out of her body to spring your healing power there into that hospital room, Lord. Lord, we pray for our pastor and his family as they have been away. I pray that this whole week has been one in which he has, he and the family have been renewed and refreshed. We ask for your continued blessing upon our pastor as he envisions your work here and has a great vision for the kingdom of God in this area. Continue to bless him and his ministry, I pray. Lord, we thank you for our missionaries. And we do pray once again for the Floyds and their work in Papua New Guinea. Thank you for providing for them for this generator. And we ask for your blessing upon uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Floyd as she um, ministers and directs these five large areas of ministry, uh, five countries of missionary activity. Help her in that, O oh Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the work of Chris and Melissa George and ask for your blessings upon them as 
as they said, to be culture planters there in Australia and to take their understanding, our Christian understanding of what it means to be a Christian and implant that in the hearts of people of Australia. Bless them in that ministry, O oh God. Lord, once again, we thank you for your love and your care and your presence in our lives. And we pray that you will continue to minister to us throughout this service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our praise team will come back and we'll worship our Lord in song. stands we continue our worship <clears throat>
of your hands. Mold us today, Father.
Our scripture passage for the morning is Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a, set, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. Twenty-six-year-old Chris Leiden wanted to craft an engagement ring for his girlfriend out of stones that he had found himself. And he spent a few years looking from place to place where he could mine for such things in order to make a personalized engagement ring for his girlfriend. And he went to a place called the Crater of Diamond State Park, which is in Arkansas. And you can go there, and any of us, I guess, could go there, and you're allowed to mine for diamonds. Take your screen or thing there where you can sift. And that's what he did. And he went there for two days and he found nothing. Then on the third day, he saw this thing shining, and it, he said it left him shaking when he saw it there. And it turned out to be a 2.2 carat diamond, which was potentially worth over $40,000. Now, in the article that I read about this, he didn't say these words that I'm about to say, because I'm going to put words in his mouth in order to be a good illustration for my sermon this morning. And here's what he said. I say to you, I have not found such a great gem, not even in all America. <laughs> well, the flavor of that is what I'm hearing from Jesus in our text in verse 9. When Jesus heard the words of the centurion spoken to him through his friends that had come to him, he said, or the text says, he marveled at him. He marveled at him. Now that Greek word translated here as marveled or amazed in the NIV and other translation, marveled or amazed, occurs 33 times in the four gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I took a little survey, as I like to do sometimes with various words, in the Bible. And I found that in most places, in most instances, the majority of the times, that when that word is used, it's used about people marveling or being amazed at Jesus. The crowds, 
um, the disciples, the Pharisees even, even Pilate a couple of times, were marveling at something that Jesus would say. Or what he would do, his miracles, his healings, they would see it. And then they would be stunned at the kind of things he would say. And the text would say, they marveled at him. But then we may be surprised, or even marvel at the fact, that there are two instances in the Gospel accounts where Jesus marvels at something. He sees something happening and he's amazed he marvels at it. The other time Jesus marveled was when uh, he was in his hometown of Nazareth. And we see that in Mark 6.6 6, where it says, And he marveled because of their unbelief. Their unbelief. Now we're not going to get into that this morning, but I just point that out to note the irony of the only two times in the Gospel accounts where it said that Jesus marveled is that one time it was because of unbelief, the other time it was because of great faith. Opposite, totally opposite. So if Jesus marvels at something, I think it's a good idea for us to pause and say, what's he marveling at? Maybe we need to marvel also at whatever this is. And we want to do that this morning. Jesus marveled at him. Why? Why was he marveling at him? At the centurion in verse 9. Was Jesus starstruck at the fact that a Roman centurion uh, had approached him? This man, he was, he was a man of power and authority. He had a hundred men under his charge. He's pretty important there in Israel. Might not be a bad idea even to have him on our side. Uh, be good for security. Because... Jesus had his enemies, certainly. No, Jesus is not impressed by his position or his power or the things that he had accomplished. And he had accomplished many great things. The text says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at them. When he heard these things. So he... What he's marveling at is he hears a man who's able to articulate in just a couple of sentences an explanation or a definition of what Jesus calls great faith. And Jesus marvels at that, to see such a thing or to hear such a thing. It was the man's announcement, not his accomplishments, that caused Jesus to marvel. Now, for Jesus, any moment can be a teaching moment. And that's what happens here. You know, he, when he hears this, he doesn't just pause, stroke his beard, and say to himself, marvelous, great faith. But what we hear in the text says to us is that he stopped in his tracks, I think, and then turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, and he has something to say to them. So pause there a minute and realize that he's turning around to this crowd who are followers. They like Jesus. They marvel at him. They are the ones that the words usually are described as marveling Jesus. And he takes this teaching moment now to give them another marvel. He says to them, here is great faith. I want you to think about this. I want to encourage conversation and thought about this that you too might come to an understanding of what great faith is. It's a teaching moment for us also to hear what great faith is all about. So Jesus turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. You know, it's almost like Jesus had been looking for something for a long time. And now he's saying to this crowd, I found it. I found it. This is early on in his ministry, three years of ministry, and this is early on because if you look in the previous chapter, chapter 6, uh, he just got around to appointing uh, his 12 apostles. 
there in that chapter. So it's early in the ministry. He hasn't had a lot of time in his three years of ministry yet. It's just at the start of it to be looking for this. But I venture to say that Jesus, who is 30 years old at this point, has been looking for a long time. He ran a business, we assume a carpentry business there in Nazareth, rubbing shoulders regularly with people, talking to people on a regular basis, traveling back and forth to Jerusalem. We know as a Jew he would be going there regularly to celebrate the Jewish holidays, the festivals and the feasts. And is he always on the lookout? Is there great faith in Israel? He's saying here, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. But looking, oh, it's so good to find it. Now, I think this had to sting a little bit when he said that to these admirers, these followers of Jesus, to hear him say that. All of Israel, and now what are you doing? You're pointing at this Roman centurion who is kind of a representative of the enemy of Israel. This Gentile, how did the 12 apostles take it? They had just been chosen as, as special, as uh, elected by God to be with Jesus, to learn from him. They, they had to think, wow, Jesus is really hitting us hard here. The place he found it was in an unexpected place, a Roman, a Roman centurion. Jesus says, I found it. Here's exhibit A of great faith, this Roman centurion. Well, he goes ahead and says it, even though that might not have been too popular to say with these people, because Jesus wasn't out to win popularity contests, to soft pedal reality. He told it like it is. He, he's a lover of the truth. And the truth is that sometimes we find godly gems in unexpected places. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. Well, let's back up to verse 1 and walk our way through those verses until we get to the centurion and then look at him more closely. Let's be asking, why does Jesus marvel? And then why does he say, I have found great faith? What can we see here that helps us to understand great faith for our own lives? And my hope, of course, this morning is that as we examine this, that we will uh, come to a, a better understanding of faith, that our own faith will be enlarged, uh, that this won't be just a story in the Bible, uh, but a way of living in the world. So, go back to verse 1. We read, Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he concluded all his sayings. What were his sayings? Well, if you got your Bibles open, you look back, and my Bible is uh, Jesus' words are in red, and there's a whole bunch of words in red in chapter 6. Those are the sayings that we're talking about, or that uh, Luke is talking about in 7-1. And from 620 uh, to verse 49, 30-some verses, we have there Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew takes three chapters. Luke gives us the Reader's Digest version. He condenses it into those 30 verses, but it's, it's the same kind of things that are being expressed in the Sermon on the Mount. Then the rest of verse 1 says he entered Capernaum. So there they were. They had just finished this Jesus seminar out on a grassy hill somewhere. And the master teacher had given them his manifesto for being a Jesus follower. That's what those words are, those sayings. And now basically he is saying to them, let's go rub shoulders with the people and, and see if we can take what we have put in your heads through the Sermon on the Mount, that I hope is getting into your hearts, and now we want to see it worked out with your hands, working with people, putting 
the teachings into action. And so we move on, and I think something's going to happen here. Look at verse 2. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So Luke is setting the stage for us for some action. Verse 3, so when he heard about Jesus. Now, this may make it sound like this is the first time in his life that he ever heard about Jesus, but I don't think that's it here. Because if he was a Roman centurion posted there in Capernaum, assigned there, then he certainly had heard about him before. And I don't doubt, I'm pretty sure, that he had been really thinking and contemplating about who this person was, this person of Jesus. Back in chapter 4, after the Jews, after the Jews in Jesus' hometown had tried to kill him, literally, tried to kill him, I'm not speaking metaphorically, back there, we read in chapter 4, verse 31, then he went down to Capernaum, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And so he was a regular there in Capernaum. He was a regular in their Sabbaths, uh, in their synagogue on the Sabbath. And Capernaum was the hometown of Peter and several other disciples. And it seems to be the home base for Jesus when he's in the region of Galilee. He was there a lot. And so this man certainly had heard about Jesus, but now he hears about Jesus coming back into Capernaum, and he has this need. He's not hearing about Jesus for the first time, but he's hearing about him coming back into the city. And so what does he do? We read this in verse 3. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And uh, the Greek word for elders there happens to be presbyterius. Presbyterians. So someone has said that the centurion sent Presbyterians to Jesus. And of course, what that is, is the Presbyterians got the name for their denomination from this Greek word for elders, and elders were simply the leading leaders, the leaders or rulers of the community of Capernaum, and they are being sent by the centurion, a Gentile, they are being sent to talk to Jesus. Verses 4 and 5, we hear their appeal to Jesus on behalf of the centurion. And when you hear what they have to say, you might be tempted to think, wow, this is what caused Jesus to marvel at the man. He marveled at him. Listen to what they had to say. The situation, of course, is that Jesus, excuse me, the Jews did not like Romans, and Romans weren't particularly fond of Jews either. You might say they were enemies. The Romans had conquered the Jewish people. Jews hated having these foreigners in their land. They put all kinds of taxes on them and just oppressed them in many ways. And the Jews were looking for and hoping for a king who would take charge and get rid of those Romans. But along comes these Jewish leaders of Capernaum, and they tell Jesus what an amazing man this centurion is. Verse 5, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. So this is something to marvel at, but it's not what Jesus is going to marvel at, is it? When they say he loves our nation, it means that he had embraced Judaism, I think, for himself. Because there were people in Jesus' day that, uh, <clears throat> Gentiles in Jesus' day, that were called God-fearers. God-fearers. And it meant that they had come to love and honor the God of the Jews, although they themselves had not become Jews themselves. But they worshipped him. And they honored the God of the Jews. Cornelius is another example of that in Acts chapter 10. But there's something else that they said about this man. <clears throat> in verse 4, 
which I hadn't mentioned yet. They say to Jesus, please Jesus, go do what this man wants you to do because, what? He is deserving. Or the King James Version says, he is worthy. He is worthy. And that's a key word in this story. Which brings me then to the point to point out that there are two main statements from the centurion. Two things that he says that helps us to understand better why Jesus marveled and said he has great faith. The first statement that he makes is found in verse 6. And in that verse he says the opposite of what the Jewish elders were saying about him. He says in verse 6, I am not worthy. And this speaks, of course, of his humility. We're told that Jesus almost gets to the house when this man sends a second delegation of men. And this time it's not the Presbyterians, but it's his friends. And through these friends, the centurion says to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Now, some have suggested that the reason he's saying this is because as a person that had become well acquainted with the, Jew, with the Jews and the Jewish ways, he understood that the Jews had a regulation or a rule that said that if a Jew goes into the house of a Gentile, he becomes ceremonially unclean to worship God. So they were prohibited from doing that. But I think it goes deeper than that. I think there's more to the centurion's humility than just keeping a Jewish rule. It goes deeper than race, the fact that one's a Jew and one's a Gentile. Notice what he says further in verse 7. Therefore I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. So it wasn't just that, uh, it wasn't just a matter of Jesus coming into his house, which would have made him unclean. But it was a matter of him even going to Jesus that he feels he's not worthy of. And notice the word think. I think that, I believe that word think is not just talking about a passing thought that occurred to him on the spur of the moment. I think that word think represents hours of contemplation about himself and about God and about this person who is here and the authority and power of God in his life. So I don't believe he's saying these things just so he doesn't offend a Jew. He's describing his own deep sense of humility of who he is approaching. I think he's having the same reaction to Jesus that Peter had back in Luke chapter 5. Same book, chapter 5, verse 8. And Peter had just witnessed an amazing, miraculous catch of fish that Jesus had performed in which there were two boats filled with these fish that are about to sink because there were so many of them. Peter saw that and he realized that he was in the presence of the divine. And we read this from Peter in verse 8. Depart from me, Peter says, for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. It's the same reaction that way back in the Old Testament that Isaiah had when he got a vision of the Lord and the majesty and the greatness of God was, was shown to him. And Isaiah says in verse 5 of Isaiah 6, Woe to me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. It's the reaction any man or woman has in the presence of utter goodness, beauty, and majesty. And the reaction is, I am not worthy to be here. Humility. Now, humility, this virtue can be misunderstood and probably is by some as to what it really means. 
Dallas Willard says that humility is not humiliation. It's not about demeaning yourself or letting others demean you. It's not saying I am worthless, but I am not worthy. And so house churches, when you explore this further, make sure you understand the difference. I have a question on there about that. Make sure you look at that and think about it and pull your thoughts together as to what's the difference between saying, I'm not worthy, which is a Christian virtue, as opposed to saying, as an isolated and lonely person might say, I am worthless. Well, the second statement that this man makes, which helps us to understand why Jesus marveled and said that this man had great faith, is found in verse 7. But say the word, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. And then what he does is he goes on and he explains why he believes in the power of Jesus' word. In addition to the man's humility, it's this explanation that he gives that stopped Jesus in his tracks to announce to his followers, this is rare, great faith. And as I said earlier, I think this man has deep spiritual insight. One way to define faith is that it is the ability to see things that not everyone else is able to see. I think there's some place in Hebrews that says that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Able to see things that other people are not able to see. G. Campbell Morgan says he had a remarkable spiritual apprehension. That's faith. This man had lived his whole adult life in the military. He understood how military, military life worked. It was his livelihood. But he didn't just earn a living as a centurion. He started thinking about how his way of life and the what, how he was living was a pattern or a model for how things work out on a larger scale. How they worked on a larger scale. That's interesting that he's doing that. I think he's a, he's a philosopher in a, in a way. He philosophizes about his life. And he takes what he sees and, and is around him. And he's able to apply it to spiritual things. And I think God's calling all of us to do that sort of thing. We all have jobs, vocations, hobbies, things we do every day, things we observe. May God help us to take these things, which are a revelation from God, to learn from them and think about how they apply to larger things in our lives. All things were made by God, so one thing can inform another. One thing can teach us about the other. And this man did this wonderfully and beautifully. Again, the key statement is, say the word, say the word. And then he illustrates the power of the word from what he has experienced in his own life as a centurion, whereby he could speak words and things would happen. He had learned that that was a reality in his military life, and he then projects it onto the universe, you might say. The commands that he utters here have the true military ring and snap, uh, says commentary Lenski. You hear him saying, go, come. That's something an officer would say to his soldiers and something that this centurion would say. He says it, it happens, he just commands it, and his word has effect. Now, this doesn't always happen, as it should, in lines of authority. Sometimes the boss tells the employee, go do this, and the boss, or the employee, goes and does something different. Might get into a little bit of trouble, but it doesn't always play out the way it's supposed to. And I think the place where lines of authority most often don't work 
is with parents in authority over their children. Mom says to her child, don't hit your brother. And then in the next moment, bam, the brother is bawling his eyes out. But in the military, in the military, it always or most often works, this line of authority. Something is said, the word goes out, and it happens. This man experienced that. He knew that's how, uh, he knew that's the power of the word. And he says, this has to be true about Jesus. He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. If it's true of him, it has to be true of Jesus in a greater sense, he believes. And especially as he has come to contemplate and meditate upon who this Jesus actually is. Well, do you have great faith like this? We can. We don't have to join the military to learn it, but we can come to this man's understanding by learning more and more about our Lord and His power and His authority and truly believe, truly believe that His words, His promises are powerful and have effect. Well, what's a way that we can summarize what is happening in this miracle story? I happen to listen to a message from a, <clears throat> a pastor in Oregon named John Curson. And I really like the way he summarized these two thoughts that we're dealing with here this morning of this miracle story of humility and faith. He said it this way, quote, it's not about our worthiness, but it's all about God's word to us. It's not about our worthiness, but it's all about God's word to us. There are two key statements that the centurion made. And likewise, there's two things for us to think about this morning. Number one, how do we approach God? And number two, what's our view of his word? Again, we can answer that with this man's statement that, we just, that I just gave you. Number one, it's not about our worthiness, the way we approach God. But it's all about God's word. How do we view his word? But the fact is, number one, sometimes we do approach God trying to bring our worthiness into the picture. The approach of the elders who came to Jesus is not uncommon in the way that people approach God. And we may even catch ourselves saying or thinking or praying, Lord, I've been working so hard for you. I've been so faithful. Why then is this difficulty coming my way? We're trying to bring our, our worthiness to God. Or we might say in praying for somebody else, Lord, look at all that person has done. It's faithful to you. It's served you faithfully. So I pray that you will do this in his life. It's not about our worthiness. Come to God in humility, not with our worthiness, but believing in the mercy and grace of God. Secondly, what is your view of God's word? While I was shoveling snow on Friday, I was listening to this podcast by John Mark Comer. Again, he happens to be a pastor in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. And the title to this sermon was, unanswered prayer and he was giving 15 reasons why we may not get what we pray for um, and at one point he said let me give you my definition of prayer or excuse me my definition of faith and I thought oh good I'm going to get a good in-depth discourse on faith that's going to help me with my sermon but here's what he said it was very simple, but I thought it applies so well to what we're saying here today. He said this, Faith is taking God at His word. Faith is taking God at His word. The centurion had an amazing view of Jesus' word. In some ways, we're like this centurion because we too 
can't see Jesus. He never saw Jesus. And never, Jesus actually never saw him there in this story anyway. And we don't see Jesus. We don't get to touch him physically. And he doesn't touch us physically. So we're somewhat like that. But we do have his words. We have so many of his words, his precious promises. What is your view of his words? Do you have the view that this centurion had of the power in those words for our lives? Finally, I'd like to close with the brief prayer that's on the back of your bulletin at the bottom of the outline. And in my study for this sermon, I, I learned that there's a tradition in the Catholic Church where this prayer is said as they are receiving communion. And as you can see, the prayer uses the two statements of the centurion. It's a beautiful prayer using the humility and the faith of the centurion. But in this case, the prayer is not for the healing of a centurion servant, but for the person making the prayer. You know, back there in verse 9, when Jesus announces that he has found great faith, I hear delight in his voice that he found this great faith. I found a gem, he seems to be saying. And I think that this prayer said in sincerity, brings delight to our Lord. So I'd like us to close by us all saying it together. Let's say it in unison, if you have that bulletin in front of you. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let's pray further. Lord, indeed, we need to recognize today of our own unworthiness as we look at the holy, pure God and His Son, Jesus Christ. May we always approach you in that way. And then, O oh Lord, teach us. Teach us more and more of your words in order to be able to say with the centurion, by your word, you can do anything. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand in closing this morning.
receive our benediction. Now go with the with your faith overcoming the world. Amen.